Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this webinar, which is hosted by Orthopaedic Research UK in association with Orthopaedic Academy. Um, this evening, we have Mr. Sam Molyneux, who is a consultant orthopaedic surgeon at the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh, and he's going to give us a lecture on carpal instability. Um, we are going to listen to the lecture. If you have any questions, if you could write them in the chat, and we'll be able to ask Mr. Molyneux at the end of the lecture. Um, we will then stop the recording and we'd ask for people to volunteer if they would like some Viva practice. So um, if you put yourself forward, we know it's very daunting, but it's the best practice that you can have before the exams. And it's better to make mistakes here than in the actual exam itself. Um, we're not here to pick on you or make it uncomfortable. We're here to coach and support you so that you can correct any minor things that you might need to before the exams. Um, the session will be recorded, so if you miss a part of it, don't panic. It'll be available on the ORUK website and the Orthopaedic Academy YouTube channel um, for you to watch. Um, the other thing I just want to mention is ORUK and Orthopaedic Research run these intensive Viva mock courses. We've got one on the 15th of October, the 3rd of December, and there's one in January. Um, I think there's only observer spaces left for the 15th. Um, I'm not sure when I went on the website to check it said only observer, but we've got participant and observer spaces for the 3rd of December. And you can book them if you go to the Orthopaedic Academy website, it will send you, it will link you through to the ORUK booking page, or you can go direct to ORUK and book on their website. So um Mr. Molyneux has kindly agreed to um, join us this evening. Um, he, as I said, he's an orthopaedic surgeon in the Royal Lancaster in the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh, um, and he leads a hand and wrist clinic as well as busy trauma clinics. He's interested in lower limb sports and exercise related pain and exertional compartment syndrome. He organizes several local, national, and international conferences and is the training program director for Southeast Scotland. His research interests include general trauma, wrist injuries, hand trauma and pain, compartment syndrome, and finger injuries. So um, I think it will be a very interesting lecture for everyone this evening, and I hope we'll all learn something new. So I'll hand you over to Mr. Molyneux. Thank you very much. Thank you. First of all, can I just check? Can everyone see that OK? Yep, you can see in here. Absolutely. Great. Well, thanks for the introduction. I'm Sam Molyneux. As, as you say, I'm a, mainly a trauma surgeon up in Edinburgh, and I do a lot of our hand and wrist bony injuries. And I thought this would be a good topic because when we come to the exams, it's very daunting thinking about carpal instability and carpal injuries. And people get really het up about it and try and get really confusing classification systems and they get very confused about what's going on. So my plan for today is to try and break it down and make it simple to the kind of level that's required for you in the exam. Don't forget in the exam, you're not needed to be a hand surgeon. You are needed to be a general on-call person who can deal with this kind of hand injury and discuss why you're doing what you're gonna be doing. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about anatomy biomechanics, which is really complicated, but I'm going to try and make it nice and simple. A little bit about imaging. Um, I'm unashamedly going to talk about scaphoid fractures because that is by far the majority of the root cause behind um, carpal instability. And then we're going to talk a little bit about perilunate injuries. And then I've got a couple of cases that we can do as vivas. So the anatomy, please just be able to name the bones in the hand. It's amazing how often you get someone into a viva and it's like, right, we'll name these bones and they get the triquetrum, the trapezoid and the trapezium the wrong way around. It, just learn them. It doesn't take much. And you really feel like an idiot if you can't get them right. But when you look about them, think of them as two separate rows, really, a proximal row and a distal row. And so the distal row is made of hamate, capitate, trapezoid and trapezium with the proximal row called this intercalated row, the scaphoid, lunate and triquetrum. And the reason why we think of them in two rows is that they almost act independently of each other. The other way to look at is ulnar column, medial and radial column, and a force that goes through each of those columns during maximal grip strength. So the ulnar side only takes 15% of the force, 
middle column takes about 35 and the radial side is the one that takes the major part of the force going through the wrist. And that makes sense if you think about when you're gripping, a lot of your grip comes through the radial side of your wrist. When you look at it in the sort of terms of the bony anatomy, there's a whole thousand different ligaments and things that you can think about, but I wouldn't worry too much about them. Once again, just think about the bony anatomy and what the actual bones are called. And then just be aware that within each carpal row, the ligaments are really strong. And it's almost like the, the joints are invisible when you look into a wrist. So if you can see those joints, then something's torn apart and something's wrong. If you need to think about ligaments, don't forget about the main ones. So scaphalunate ligament, lunotriquetral ligament are the ones that you really need to learn about. And don't forget the radius scaphalunate ligament, because when it comes to the perilunate injuries, this is the really strong ligament on the volar aspect of the wrist that holds the lunate in place. And when I talk about distal radius fractures, it's what pulls the lunate out of position sometimes. And with perilunate fractures, it's the thing that holds the lunate when everything else gets ruptured around it. So it's worth remembering at least that one. When you think about the strength of the scaphalunate and the lunotriquetral ligaments, we always talk about when you go in and fix the scaphalunate, we fix mainly the distal part of the scaphalunate ligament. And that's because when you think about the joint between the scaphoid and the lunate, it's the dorsal part of the scaphalunate ligament that is by far the strongest, with the palmar side not being very strong. Lunotriquetral injuries are much rarer, but actually the lunotriquetral part, it's the palmar part that is stronger. So they're slightly counterbalancing each other. When we talk about that proximal row, I was talking about it as an intercalated segment. Now, that what does that mean? It took me a while to get the hang of this. It basically means that the proc row essentially has no muscles directly controlling its movements. The movements of the middle row are controlled by the movements of the distal row and by the position of the distal radius. So that intercalated segment is entirely reliant on a very fine balanced control of rest of the carpus to hold it in position. So it's called an intercalated segment with no sort of muscle control going into it. When you look at wrist movements, don't forget that there's a lot more movement within the carpus than people think. People generally imagine the carpus as being stationary with the radiocarpal joint as being the one that produces all of the movement. But in fact, there's a lot of movement at the um, intercarpal joints as well. And so when you're moving from extension into flexion, nearly 50% of that movement occurs within the carpus. So if you have that carpal instability or a thickness within the carpus, you can lose an awful lot of the flexion extension of the wrist. When we're talking about side to side movements, that proximal row, and in particular the scaphoid, has to slide ulnarwards and radial, but it also flexes and extends. So when you go into radial deviation like that, yes, the scaphoid slides down this way, but it also flexes out of position. And that's why you see what's this signet ring sign looking down the middle of the scaphoid. The scaphoid flexes because there's not much space. And then when you go into ulnar deviation, the scaphoid fills that gap by extending up into position. And here you can see it along its length. And that's why we get all these different views of the carpus when you're looking for scaphoid fractures. This is a really important concept that most people seem to understand these days, but the proximal row is under a dynamic balanced tension. So what does that mean? It means that the scaphoid is desperate to flex and the liquid is desperate to extend. And the two balance each other out with the lunate in there being tugged in both directions and holding it all in the right place. So if you cut anywhere from the distal end of the scaphoid to the lunate, then that radial side will flex and the lunate and the triquetrum will extend. If you cut anywhere between the lunate and the triquetrum, then the scaphoid will pull the lunate forwards and the triquetrum will extend. So in other words, scaphoid side is trying to flex, triquetral side is trying to extend it. And if you break anything, then they move apart from each other. And that's what gives you this dizzy and busy deformity. So what do we mean by that? A dorsal intercalated segmental instability just means that 
intercalated row, that first row, is pointing dorsally. And that means that something has given between the end of the scaphoid and the lunate. So it could be a scaphoid fracture, it could be a scapho lunate injury. And when you look at the scaphoid, it looks more flexed than it should, and the lunate is facing backwards. If you injure between the lunate and the triquetrum, then the lunate flexes and you get a volar intercalated segment instability. So the lunate goes into extension and the, sorry, the triquetrum goes into extension and the lunate follows the scaphoid into um, volar angulation. So as I said earlier, when we're getting imaging of the carpus, it's really difficult to see scaphoid fractures. Everyone knows that. So we get lots and lots of different views so that we can see the scaphoid at different angles. In the, an angle through the scaphoid that shows us whether or not the scaphoid's broken. The other thing that we're looking at is non-scaphoid injuries around the wrist. And so what we're looking for really, I'm gonna to come to in a bit more detail, is whether there's any disruption of Galula's arcs. And a clenched fist view puts force into the capitate, driving it between the lunate and the scaphoid and can widen that gap if there's any instability between the scaphoid and the lunate. So when you're looking at your, your views of the carpus, first thing to do is just to look around each bone and make sure there's no obvious fractures in there. Because sometimes there's fractures that once you see them are obvious, but you don't notice in the first place. Next thing, is to look at these Galula's arcs. And people underestimate the power of Galula's arcs. If you look at a wrist and you see normal concentric rings as you follow the articular surfaces of all the bones, it's pretty unlikely that there's any major ligament disruption. But if you try and follow Galula's arcs and there's steps, then you know that there's something horrendously wrong going on. And if you don't bother doing that, then quite often you can miss a pretty significant wrist injury because overall the bones look okay and overall the alignment of the wrist looks all right. So follow Galula's arcs really carefully whenever you're looking at a carpal injury. Next, look for that scaphalunate angle. So the mid-axis of the scaphoid there and the mid-axis of the lunate, the angle between the two should be somewhere between 30 and 60 degrees. So here's a normal one with a line drawn up the scaphoid, line drawn up the middle of the lunate, and that angle there is between 30 and 60, so that's great. If you see that angle increased, then they've got that dizzy deformity. If you see that angle decreased, then they've got that visi deformity. So, let's move on to scaphoid fractures briefly, because this is gonna be the vast cause in your real world of reasons why when you look at a distal radius or at a carpus on the lateral view, they appear to have a dizzy deformity. So they're the commonest of the carpal injuries, really annual incidence of about 40 per 100,000. And they're usually young males taking parts in sports. And the reason the scaphoid breaks is because it's the longest of the bones. It's got the longest lever arm acting on it and it acts as a bit of a strut between the proximal and distal rows. So it gets a lot of force going through the middle of it. The trouble is that the scaphoid is a complete pig and everyone knows the scaphoid is a problem and it gives us lots of problems. The first is diagnosis because we get thousands of blooming query scaphoid fractures coming through our clinic all the time. And so everyone describes the clinical signs of a scaphoid fracture, don't they? Which are pain in the anatomical snuff box, pain on axial loading through the thumb, pain on pinch grip, pain on radial ulnar deviation, pain on flexion extension. And all of those things are okay, but unfortunately, none of them are clinically very specific. And it leaves us with a whole load of patients in whom we're not sure what clinically whether or not they've got a scaphoid. And the other thing is that on the early x-rays, virtually everyone knows that actually scaphoids can be difficult to spot. So this one here on the left looks relatively easy to see. Actually, the one on the right, you can imagine potentially missing that on your early x-rays. So the question continuously comes up in the exams, I think, right, what's, what are you going to do with this patient who's got a query scaphoid fracture? And so we think about, should we get an MRI scan, a CT scan? And the fact is that I believe probably an early MRI scan is the most sensitive and most specific of the possible um, investigations. 
it's still not 100% perfect. There's still no real gold standard on deciding whether or not there's a fracture, but it will give you a much better idea if you do it early. The trouble in our country, and I think in many countries, is that access to MRI early in A&E is virtually impossible. So what we do here in Edinburgh is actually pretty old school, I think. If somebody is a query scaphoid fracture, we tend to put them into a splint and see them back two weeks later, re-examine them. And there'll be a huge load of patients who after two weeks, it's more obvious from the examination that actually it's not a scaphoid fracture. But if they come back at examination and they have those clinical signs of a scaphoid fracture at that stage, we would think about repeat x-rays because often they'll pop up on the repeat x-rays, but they don't always by any means. And then consider an MRI or maybe a C CT scan. It has been shown that getting those early MRIs is cost effective. So if you get MRI in A&E, it probably saves you a little bit of money, but we just can't get them in our region. So most of the time, even when we want an MRI, they come back having had a CT scan. And the sensitivity on CT is probably about 85%. But if you can't see it on the CT, you've got to ask, do you really need to intervene? Because if you can't see a break on the CT scan, then probably the cartilage over the scaphoid is intact and it's a stable situation, so it means it's probably going to heal up. So I think that's relatively pragmatic. Scaphoid classification, I wouldn't get too het up about this. There's a hundred different ones. But realistically, what you're breaking it down into is sca scaphoid tubercles, type A, which you can basically ignore, and then distal scaphoid fractures through to very proximal fractures. And the reason for getting het up about that is the union rate. If you have a very distal fracture, then you're gonna end up with a fracture that's almost certain to heal as long as it's not massively displaced. The more proximal you get, the more likely it is that this scaphoid is not gonna heal. And if it's not gonna heal, that means that you're more likely to intervene. So the proximal pole fractures, you really have to think. So type D, you really have to be saying, I'm gonna intervene on this as a routine. Whereas types B and C are much less likely to intervene unless there's significant displacement. So those scaphoid tubercle fractures, treat them as a soft tissue injury, splint them, let them do whatever they want, tell them they're going to be absolutely fine. And they've, I've hardly ever seen them cause any trouble. Displaced fractures probably need to be fixed. Undisplaced waste fractures, we get a bit of... Con um, I think most of them can probably be treated in a Collie's cast. There's a lot of evidence now that there's no need for a scaphoid cast. You do not need to increase, include the thumb. So just a Collie, Collie's cast for a scaphoid fracture. The debate is whether or not we should be fixing up with percutaneous fixation, these undisplaced scaphoid waste fractures. And I think the advantages of scaphoid waste fracture fixation are theoretically that people get back to work quicker, back to sport quicker, back to their day-to-day -day life quicker. And I think for a lot of people that is probably true, but it depends on their activities. And there's been a big trial recently that I think you need to know for your exam, the SWIFT trial, looking at fixation versus non-fixation for scaphoid waste fractures that basically showed if you fix them up, there's no real improvement in their return to work, their return to sport or to any of their activities. So the suggestion was that actually we shouldn't be offering percutaneous fixation to undisplaced scaphoid waste fractures. I think that's probably overkill from their results. I think actually what that means is if you're in doubt, you can talk to the patient and say, look, you're going to be fine treated non-operatively. But there are a group of patients for whom early fixation is really useful. If I broke my scaphoid, I would want it fixed early on because that would mean by two weeks later, I'm back scrubbing in, whereas I can't scrub in with a splint on. So for me personally, getting that scaphoid fixed early makes a difference to my life. If you have someone who's a plasterer and self-employed, but working on a business on a building site, they're often not allowed to return to work with a splint on. They can return to work with their scaphoid fixed. So you have to speak to them about what their own personal issues are. But certainly learn about the SWIFT trial and learn about what it means. The other thing with the SWIFT trial is don't forget that it doesn't include things like proximal scaphoid fractures like this. And it only means that there's less than two millimeters displacement on a CT scan. So a scaphoid fracture like this is not included in the SWIFT trial because when you look at the CT scan, 
it's actually more displaced than you thought. And the final thing with the SWIFT trial is actually their non-operative arm was very, very interventional. So I think for us in our department, it's very hard to follow up a non-operative uh, scaphoid to the level that they followed up a non-operative scaphoid because they were intervening with them at six weeks, which I think is very rare worldwide for intervention, but probably the gold standard. They talked about a whole load of complications, but I think the overall complications that needed intervention were much less than that. So I think overall SWIFT trial, you should definitely know about it. It suggested that there's no real difference between the percutaneous fixation of undisplaced scaphoids and um, uh, conservative management, but just be aware of the caveats and the fact that there are patients who will definitely benefit from percutaneous intervention early on. And don't forget that undisplaced proximal pole fractures virtually never unite unless you intervene. So they need intervention with screw fixation from proximal to distal. And unstable or displaced fractures need to be fixed as well. And if they're unstable and displaced, you may be able to manage it percutaneously, but you might have to open them up and you might graft them. I think I'm going to move on from scaphoid non-union because we're going to go on to carpal instability. So the other definitions that I think cause a whole world of trouble in, car in carpal instability is that they're so badly named because they've got these horrendous dissociative carpal instability, non-dissociative carpal instability complex, and it really doesn't help, but it's very simple. A dissociative uh, carpal instability just means it's within one of those rows. So there'd been a blow apart between something within the proximal row or within the distal row. On this side means it's between the proximal row and the distal row, and by far the majority are some kind of mixture of the two, a complex intracarpal instability. And the other one to remember is this one here, the adaptive carpal instability, which is really common because we see so many distal radius fractures that are treated conservatively. And then when you look at the carpus, the carpus looks like it's horrendously flexed. It's actually fine. It's just making up for the abnormality in the distal radius. So those are your definitions, but they're quite difficult to remember. Just keep them nice and simple. By far, the majority of carpal instabilities are involved in perilunate dislocation, and these cause all kinds of angst. Very worthwhile knowing the Mayfield classification, which describes a progressive perilunate instability, starting with number one at the scaphal lunate ligament, then a disruption between the lunate and the capitate, then a disruption between the lunate and the triquetrum, and finally the lunate losing its position within the radius, within the uh, lunate fossa of the distal radius. And when you look at the action that's happening here, this is looking from the lateral side with the wrist being forced backwards. You're getting a rupture of the scaphalunate ligament first. That leaves the capitate open to move further and levers it out of the distal part of the lunate. And as it moves further off the back, the lunotriquetral ligament goes. And usually it gets held by that short radius scaphalunate ligament and then eventually, as the wrist pops back into position, it can knock the lunate back off the front and down in front of the radius. And only very occasionally will that short radius scaphal lunate ligament get ruptured so that you have a free floating little marble of the lunate itself. But it can happen, in which case you find it way down in the forearm. So Mayfield's classification is great, and those progressions are very true, but don't forget that it doesn't really discuss the fact that there's lesser and greater arc injuries. So the lesser and greater arc injuries are exactly the same thing. It's just the greater arc means that instead of rupturing through the ligaments, you've ruptured through some of the bone. And it's very, very rare to get a true, pure, greater arc injury. What you tend to get is a mix of greater arc and lesser arc. So for instance, a fracture coming through the scaphoid and then the rest of it being a ligamentous injury with the lesser arc and then a perilunate dislocation. So how do you examine for scaphalunate injuries? Well, really they've got pain over the scaphalunate. They may have clicking on scaphoid shift test. So you can sometimes push the scaphoid 
in and out of its correct position within the radial fossa. And sometimes when you put the wrist into extension, if you hold the distal part of the scaphoid in the right place and force it out of position by using radial deviation, you'll feel a clunk as the scaphoid forces its way out of position. So it's worth practicing with somebody who knows how to do it. Um, scaphoid shift test and feel for scaphoid lunate belotment. When you look at the radiology, you get widening between the scaphoid and the lunate. It's called the Terry Thomas sign, named after the actor Terry Thomas. And you see this scaphoid signet ring sign. And so the scaphoid looks like a circle end on because it's flexed so much into a um, flexed position. And once again, when we look from the lateral side, we have that dizzy deformity because the scaphoid is wanting to flex and the lunate and the triquetrum are extending. CT and MRI are probably reasonable. If you've got any doubt about a scaphoid lunate injury itself rather than a perilunate dislocation, I think an arthroscopy can be really helpful. And these days, I think it probably is worth knowing the Geisler arthroscopic classification. It's slightly high end for the exam, but I think most people are using it just to describe anything from one, which is a minor injury to the scaphoid lunate, to four, which means when you've got a scope into the wrist, you can drive the camera in between the scaphoid and the lunate meaning they're completely unstable, essentially. So for most perilunate dislocations and for a scaphalunate injury, the key to it all is to repair the scaphalunate and to hold the bones in the right place until the scaphalunate ligament has a chance to recover. And the way to do this is to hold it with K wires, then to fix the scaphalunate, let it all heal and then remove the K wires because your fixation of the scaphalunate ligament is never sufficient to hold the carpus in place. So the, the wires do that until your scaphalunate heals up. So this is a case from a while ago with one of my colleagues, Jane McKechn. So a dorsal approach down to that wrist, you open up the capsule and then under here you can see, sorry, my pointer is not working for some reason. There's a big gap, that's the lunate with a wire in it. So we're holding the lunate in the position it's meant to be. And then at the top end of the screen is the radial side. So there's a big gap there where the scaphoid should be. And if you push on it with a finger, you can see the scaphoid pushing back into position. And there's the scaphoid ligament that's been ripped off the side of the lunate. So what you want is to hold that while you have a chance to repair the scaphoid ligament. So in goes a wire from the scaphoid into the lunate. The lunate still being held in place by this joystick wire. And then a wire goes from the scaphoid into the capitate to hold the, the scaphoid to stop it flexing down because it's desperate to flex. And when you look on the lateral view, we've got the lunate held in the right position and the scaphoid lunate angle is now correct. And then everything's held and now you're just repairing that little tendon together. And you can see how tenuous that repair is. You can't rely on that to hold the carpus. So those wires now stay in place for eight to 10 weeks while that ligament heals. And then the wires can be taken out either in clinic or in theater. And hopefully by that stage, the lunate, uh, scaphoid lunate ligament has had a chance to recover. For delayed surgery, you can't repair the scaphoid lunate. There's tons of stuff described out there. I would not worry about learning at all unless you've got an injury, uh, an interest in hand surgery. Personally, I quite like using a bit of donated um, extensor carpi radialis brevis and using it to weave in as a reconstructed uh, scaphalunate ligament. But I honestly would not get into the minutiae of that in your learning. So I think I'll just show you this, just to show how you can quite easily miss what's a pretty significant injury and just to show you how on a case I would go through things at this stage. So here you can see AP and lateral of a distal radius and a patient has had a fall onto that outstretched hand. They've got an obvious radial styloid fracture. And the classic thing here is to see that and then miss the rest of the wrist. So actually it's really important to have a look at the rest of the wrist for any injuries. And you look at that scaphalunate area there and there's a little osseous injury that should make you think to yourself, oh my goodness, is there something going on here? 
And then when you look at it in a bit more detail, there's a bit of a gap there between the scaphoid and the lunate that's bigger than the gap between the lunate and triquetrum. So there's potentially a scaphoid lunate injury there. We got some other imaging, but sure enough, when you go in there, you can fix the radial styloid down, but this is me putting a probe into the space between the scaphoid and the lunate. So there's a rip between the scaphoid and the lunate. So we fix two wires between the scaphoid and the lunate to hold it in place, a wire from the scaphoid into the capitate to hold the scaphoid out into extension again, and then repair the ligament with a little suture anchor down there and hopefully get the carpal alignment reasonable. And the aim at the end of the day is really carpal alignment. And I think you have to tell patients like this that their outcome is realistically going to be pretty horrendous. And if you set them a, a low bar at the start, they're happier with you in the long run. The best outcome that a patient with this kind of injury is likely to get is approximately 50% flexion extension without pain and hopefully reasonable radial on the deviation. The trouble is that it's often young keen sporty people who think that they're going to get back to being a football goalkeeper within a few months and it's not really realistic. Mm -hmm.